Hello, hello, and welcome. Oh my goodness, it is season two of Better Together, sharing our lupus stories. You are here. Welcome back. This is going to be amazing. I'm Chanel Gabriel, and we are all the way live and talking about lupus. Now I have to bring in my wonderful co-host, the amazing Dr. Micaela Baird. Dr. Mika, so glad to have you. We're here. Hi. So great to be back. Um, great to see you, Chanel. I just want to start off by saying thank you to our sponsor, Biogen, who is helping us be here tonight. And let everyone know that if you are interested in getting more information about lupus, clinical trials, please check out www.biogentriallink.com and you can see that right below. So getting back to our show, we are going to be talking about intimacy. We're going to be talking about relationships. If you follow me on Instagram, I said we were talking not just about physical intimacy, but emotional intimacy as well. Right, Chanel? Yes, both are so important. I think we focus a lot on just one. And so we're going to talk about it both. And we want to hear from you. Make sure you join the conversation. Send us a comment or a question in the chat. And we'll be so happy to bring you into this, this beautiful dialogue we're going to have today. We have some great guests. But I'm curious, Dr. Micaela, do you usually get to talk about this subject? You know, I know we are always fighting time in an appointment and we try to get to everything. This is such an important topic that I really do try and cover because it also tells me a lot about how people are doing. So definitely don't be afraid to bring these topics up when you're talking with your doctor or rheumatologist. I mean, it's it's the little, you know, I don't think it's traditionally thought of like, let me talk about my love life with my rheumatologist, right? <laughs> or, you know, you don't think about um, that conversation. And also, I think as a person living with lupus, you know, I don't, I don't ever think about the challenges around uh, intimacy, even if I'm feeling that way, you know, thinking about like the way we engage with each other or way that affects how we emotionally connect to other people dealing with a chronic illness and knowing that maybe they don't understand. Uh, I think that that's something that we really need to, to, to bring bring to light and bring, bring into the conversation here. And so we are going to uh, kick this off in season two. We feel like I think we started season one talking about a little bit about relationships and season two. Now we're getting a little deeper. And we have a great show for you all. So our guests are here to talk about their stories on intimacy, communication, relationships, and of course, lupus. So first, we're going to meet social media darling, Jokiva, aka Indian Rose, and her husband, Howard. Now, you may remember Jokiva from her 2017 viral post about living with lupus. And you can see right here, she's been very vocal about her battle, especially with discoid lupus. Lupus. And she's showed up everywhere from Allure to news channels talking about this. So we got her right here. And next, we're going to get the single girl's POV point of view on dating and intimacy because it's a little different from Ty. We have Ty, who is a single mom and host of her own podcast, So Opinionated. And last but not least, we will meet Dr. Court, aka the girlfriend therapist, who is also a lupus warrior. And she's going to give us a professional and a personal perspective on managing intimacy and lupus. And also, hey, we have a really cool card game that she created that we're going to play with our guests. I might, I might join in. We might get Dr. Micaela to join in too. I don't know. We'll see what the questions are. <laughs> But we're going to have a good time here. And first, we have joining us live from New Orleans, Nolens, excuse me, got to say it correct, Jokiva and Howard. Let's bring Jokiva to this virtual stage. Bring both of them to the stage. Hey. hey oh, my gosh. Hi. You're in my favorite city. Okay. I need y'all to ship me some beignets. Okay. Definitely. You got me. You got me. Awesome. Well, so Jokiva, you became a social media celebrity with your post about your lupus flares um, when it went viral. And it was really, really um, a powerful image that people didn't always see when they think about chronic illness. They think about lupus. And um, and we know that later on this week, Jokiva, you're going to be a celebrity coach at the 10th annual Balling for Lupus Love Celebrity Basketball Tournament tournament happening this Saturday, July 29th. Yes. It will be Grand Prairie View, Texas. 
Okay. I mean, first of all, no one told me I'm a, I'm nice on the, on the court. Okay. I'm nice. <laughs> no, this is going to be great. So everybody out there, if you are in Texas, you in the Texas area, Prairie View, you want to get in the car, make sure you check it out. And um, they're also going to be honoring Jokiva with the Jacqueline Talley Lupus Warrior Award for being a fighter and advocate for lupus awareness. So we just celebrating you, my dear. You are doing Thank you. things. Thank you. All right, so now we're going to talk a little bit about balancing love and lupus. But first, I'm I'm, I'm gonna Howard. I, look at y'all. Look, just all the love was right there in that one little look. I just I'm geeking. All right. Well, <laughs> first we're gonna to talk to my sister Jokiva. Jo Howard, we're gonna bring you in in a second. But before we get to your love story, Jokiva, please, we'd love to hear a little bit more about your lupus story. Okay. Um, how are you guys doing? First off. Great. Okay. I was diagnosed when I was 17 in high school and how it was actually with me during that time as well. When I got diagnosed, I thought it was a lupus rash and I mean, I thought it was the doctors thought it was eczema and they misdiagnosed me until they sent me to a rheumatologist. And then like two weeks later, I was diagnosed with lupus. Mm -hmm. um, in 2014, I had my first kidney failure and that was completely different from my second kidney failure in 2016. But in the meantime of two, my second kidney failure, I chose when I was in the ER to create a video standing, you know, just telling everybody, just be conscious of what you're going through with your lupus. If you have to take your medicine, take it and listen to your doctors. And then I was still in the hospital, woke up the next day and I was like, what? A hundred, like, 153,000 likes. Crazy. Yes, ma'am. And then wow. I realized BET had did an article on me and I was like, turn up, okay. <laughs> I don't know how to I don't know how to grasp this new feeling, but over time I learned that there is a big support system with lupus. I didn't know that it was that common because I only know it would to be within my family. I didn't know, you know, I, as growing up I didn't think that it was that serious until I went through it. Mm -hmm. Um it's a lot, but I feel like we take it day and day at a time. And, you know, I have a spouse that has patients and he's just been with me every step of the way. Jokiwa, it's so good to see you. I wanted to bring you back to this really important moment because what you talked about, you know, taking some time to get your diagnosis is so real for many people. And I wanted to hear a little bit more about how that diagnosis changed things. Um, at first it didn't change because I was in denial. So I kept doing everything that the doctor, my rheumatologist told me not to do. Like he was like, do not get too stressed out. Do not overwork yourself. Well, I was working two jobs and I'm um, going to school at the same time. So I was not listening. It took a big impact on me for me to get sick, for me to realize that, Hey, this is something serious. You need to slow down and listen to what your doctor says. He even told me, you know, you have kids before 28. I'm 28 now, you know, I have two beautiful daughters and I'm done. Yay. So it sounds <laughs> like your doctor brings up a lot of topics like you talked about family planning. Did intimacy ever come in that conversation? Oh, definitely, definitely around the times when I was going through a kidney failure and I would ask some questions about, you know, what was going down um, in my, with, with my body. And I would say, hey, this is happening, and what should I do? And he'll tell me, no, you can't be intimate around that time. Or, you know, yes, you can still be intimate around this certain times. And it was hard for my husband, not at most times, but at certain times, because, you know, a man is a man at times. You know, they have certain feelings. But he was never impatient with me. And I never had that issue at all, so I'm glad. I'm so happy you had open communication with your doctor and also your partner. Um, and we just want to share your advice. So tell us what you would say to someone else who is in the same, you know, predicament, who has lupus um, and maybe is in a relationship or looking and trying to navigate that. Um, I always learned that if someone loves you, they're going to go through turmoil and obstacles with you no matter what. That's part of being in a relationship. You should never feel as if you are a burden to your partner. Your partner is there to help you anyway, anyhow. And I tend to tell a lot of women that because they feel like they don't deserve that at times and they deal with what they're dealing with at the time in that measure. And I feel like, no, you don't have to deal with someone disrespecting you 
you can move on to the next. There's somebody that will deal with your condition. You just have to, you know, take your time. Don't rush into things and, you know, focus on yourself. When you focus on yourself and you love yourself and that starts to glow, that attracts. You have to remember that attracts people to you as well. So I always will tell people don't settle. Beautiful. That is, listen, don't settle, period, period. And I really think it's so important for you, for us to remember that um, as people that are living with this chronic illness that seems to take over our lives, that we're still a whole person with it, right? We're still an yeah. amazing person with it. And so we've been talking about this wonderful man in your life that was super patient and super loving. Let's bring in hubby. Hubby, come back here, Howard. <laughs> Howard, we're so glad to have you in here. And, oh. Thank you for joining us on Better Together, sharing our lupus stories. Now, you two were high school sweethearts, which is really sweet. And now you are a, a social media couple, okay? You got her soulmate. I was like, that's so powerful. That's so powerful. He's like, I'm just going to let y'all know, period. You're going to find me on here. I'm her soulmate. <laughs> That's so beautiful. So, so as you mentioned, you know, I know Joe Kiva is going to be coaching this basketball tournament uh, in Grand Prairie, Texas. So are, are you going to the game, Howard? Did y'all work on the plays together or, is, or she just got that on lockdown? No plays yet. We're going to go. Um, we're going to teach her a little bit because she doesn't really know a lot about it. <laughs> we're gonna talk about it on the ride then you know get some basic foundations on the you know together you didn't have to put me out there like i was about to say, <laughs> <laughs> I was about to say she put you all on blast oh, <laughs> well how did you we, i'm just curious to get your your thoughts and i know tell us how actually tell us how you two met it's, it's been a while now but uh i'm curious to hear your version of the story <laughs> basically I came home one night, um, one, one, not one night, one afternoon from high school with my cousin. We was on, you know, just being young men or whatever, just being foolish. We was on Facebook and I saw her picture and I just messaged her. She ended up responding and it just continued from that. Is it really good? See that? So simple. Everybody slide in the DMs. Okay, just slide right, in just the DMs. Slide. You never know what's going to happen. You never know you what's going to happen. Pre match and all the dating apps you're still using online. Yeah. <laughs> So Howard, I asked um, your wife about you know that diagnosis, and I know that you guys were together at that time. So, you know, tell us a little bit more about how you experienced her diagnosis. I knew nothing of lupus, so I was just she asked me to bring her to the appointment. I was like, okay, let's go. Um, I basically just sat there and observed everything and just listened. So they run the test, came back like you have lupus, this, that, and the third. She told me her mom had it, but I didn't know anything about it. So I had to research, read um, books, research uh, through my phone. But it's just so much to learn. And I'm just sitting there like, I don't even know where to start. So it just started from there. Mm -hmm. I mean, whatever information I came across, that's just what I learned. I asked doctors questions, whatever they told me. That's just where I started from. And I'm still learning to this day. So I yeah. just take it every day at the time. But Sick is always something different. So mm -hmm. I'm just observing her. I can tell when she's getting sick though. Mm -hmm. well, I mean, we've been together so long. I can literally just look at her eyes and just be like, you don't feel well today. You need some rest today or whatever it may be. And that's just how it is. Are there times where you need to hear that from him, Jokiva, like that, you know, you may not be feeling well and he can pick up on it even before you? Definitely, definitely. Cause I will push, push myself to extreme measures. Right. And just make myself more sick until you know my body shuts down and he he doesn't he never wants me to get to that point. No, not yeah. I love that's that. Cool. That's so, beautiful that he supports you in that way. That's really yeah. lovely. Yeah. So we heard you guys have two kids and you're talking about, you know, picking up on your symptoms and communicating all this. Congratulations, by the way, because I heard you also have a four month old. But Thank where you. are you finding the time for all this? Oh yay. What are their oh. names? Well, um, it takes it around children. You just gotta. It's it's a hit and miss. Mm -hmm. um, the the intimacy part is definitely. No, that's, no, that's out the window. Mm, you know, we just that. at that point we're um, we're just very emotional, staying in contact, and then we're start now we're starting to after the kids we're starting back. We made a promise to each other. We're starting going on dates. Like after we leave Every her weekend, date. Just, yeah. Every weekend it's a date because you never want to lose that type of love or intimacy or that excitement with each other. Right. So now we're just bringing that back to each other as well. 
Right. But the kids, they'll drain you. I ain't going to lie. <laughs> we tired right now. Look. I don't even get to take naps no more. They were gum out, so we might take a nap. <laughs> when the and kids then, take a nap, you all take a nap too. <laughs> but the no, three year old don't nap. No, we have to <laughs> oh, no. Eventually, hopefully. You know, so you guys are already talking about good things that you find, you know, time for each other. You are getting some rest when you can. What would you say is the most challenging part of finding time for intimacy? Especially if you're not feeling well, Jokiba. Um, I mean, the most challenging thing is the kids. It's just really the kids. kids. I mean, if she's doing like right now, she's doing very well with her health. So when she's ready, you know, let's go. If the situation is correct, let's go. But on yeah. the most part, it's really just the kids right. and just having a just a flow with the house, just having everything going together. I didn't think it was a full time job, ma'am. I'm ready to tell my story. I didn't think it was a full-time job until I had them. And I have like, a two-year-old, and I have no idea how you're doing two under that age. So uh, wait till three. It's another one. No, wait till three. I'll just be. I'm a professional auntie, so y'all could just drop them off for me. I'll babysit. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, drop them off to New York. Thank you. My sister said the same thing, and I'm like, girl, come and get them. <laughs> But um, I'm just curious. Um, so was there any challenges around like communication around uh, just not feeling well or being intimate or things of that nature? And I think intimate is, is physical as well as emotional. You know, was it easy? Was it, has it always been easy to communicate when you're not feeling well? No. In the beginning, he, he wasn't that experienced. So as I went through it, he learned. But it was sometimes to where he wouldn't understand. And I'll be like, babe, I'm really hurting. Like it's I can't, I can't stand up, up hurt. I can't, you know, I need help. And yeah. one time it, he just really understood because I was breathing heavily and I just wasn't waking up. I wasn't alert. I wasn't aware. And he 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 panicked. I think uh, that's when it hit him. Yeah, we had to go to the hospital. And he She was having um I know it was a lupus flare, but I think yeah. the kidneys was, were acting up. Yeah, my kidneys yeah. were failing. And that was we were nineteen years old and twenty. Right. And so he yeah. literally we were kids. We were still kids, he would clean me. And everything. Um, so I'm telling you, ladies, don't give up because there's somebody else that will do it for you. <laughs> I mean, that's such an important moment because you're not only, you know, showing up for her, but also kind of trying to navigate the healthcare system. What was that like for you, Howard? Um, I see. Yeah, it's for me just being the person that's just sitting there. It's aggravating for me because. I'm just watching her get attended to if it's correctly or not correctly. If she feel like she's getting the proper care or not, I'm just there. My voice doesn't matter. I can't really do anything. Oh, it did sometimes. When it needed to, you know, in the future. But in the beginning, I'm just present. I'm just here to learn. So I couldn't really do anything. But as we got older and ventured to other states that have different health care, we see difference. We see the differences in the systems. So when we stayed in Dallas for four years, we were able to see their system when we were in atlanta for a little while we were able to see their system compared to new orleans so but your response like when they're not doing their job i have to be like calm down but they mess them <laughs> up i mean I th i'm not just gonna sit there and just say hey you're doing from my observation you're doing something wrong that i've never seen other doctors do they got her healthy so some treatments didn't help other treatments did help so when the things that didn't help hey you're doing the things that really didn't work before and now you're blowing out her veins now you know, she's on other medicines because of maybe something that really didn't have to happen. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's so important, um, this idea of having an advocate as well. I think we've talked about that in past episodes and, and what having an advocate being present I and mean, how helpful it is to have someone in your corner in those moments where it sometimes feels like you're fighting a doctor or you're fighting a medical system and you have somebody with you. And so I guess I, I would love to ask, we have a couple minutes left, but um, uh, for this segment, because we we're going to we're going to bring you guys back to, to, to play our fun little game that we have at the end. But um, I'm just curious, what advice would you say, you know, specifically to somebody that's looking for um, ways to really communicate with their partner? Is there anything that each of you can say as a person with lupus and then Howard as a person that's uh, in a relationship with someone living with lupus? We definitely had to learn that it's us first. Don't Ooh, expect that? anyone in your business because that can cause relationship problems as well. But if you're just honest and have straightforward communication with each other, 
you shouldn't have any issues at all. It had times to where I had to be quiet and let him talk and he had to be quiet and let me talk and tell speak completely through thoroughly for us to understand. Don't cut him off because then you might say something wrong and that person didn't mean it that way. The um the communication has to be there first and you always have to remember it's you and him that started the relationship. And right. you and him will make that relationship work. The only third person that needs to be in your business is God. Amen. <laughs> what about you, Howard? What do you think as a person, what advice would you give someone who might be entering a relationship with someone living with lupus? Have patience. Just start off with patience. Just take it slow. Every day, you know, you never know how they're going to feel. You never know what they're going through. You never know emotionally how they feel. So have patience communicate that's really one of the main important things is just have communication talk about everything if you if you don't understand ask a question if they don't understand let them ask their question and keep talking about it until you have until y'all are able to understand 100 percent how each other will feel and then y'all solve the problem let's move forward let's go Thank you. Thank you so much. I appreciate, we, we very much appreciate having you share these uh, thoughts. And and Howard, I know you were supposed to leave, but shout out to your boss for letting you take time off to be here. <laughs> yeah, he really, he kind of understood, you know, we had a late um, conversation last night and he kind of understood where I was coming from. So he let me get the day off. Yeah, so glad to have both of you present today. And we're going to make sure we bring you both back in to keep, keep talking a little bit more about this subject. But thank okay. you. And now um, we're going to move into this next segment. Um, now, as Dr. Bayard says, it's always good to talk to a medical professional. And while Dr. Bayard is definitely our expert <laughs> here, we have a guest expert that we are going to bring in. Welcome, Dr. Court also known as the girlfriend therapist. Actually, we're going to keep um, Jokeva and Howard you in, in the mix here. We're going to maybe throw a question or two your way as we talk to Dr. Court. Dr. Court, welcome. Thank so you. you are, thank you. You are a lupus warrior. You are the girlfriend therapist. And you've also created a card game to help with intimacy. So we're going to play that later. But Dr. Court, we're talking about intimacy for couples as well as for singles. So you're the girlfriend therapist. Please, please tell us a little more about your background, about yourself. <laughs> so I am Dr. Cortina Peters. My married name is Lewis. Um, and I'm also known as the girlfriend therapist. So I started that because I thought it was extremely important for individuals to understand that Therapy is not just for non-melanated individuals, but for everybody. So I wanted to help destigmatize and decolonize what it means to go to therapy. And so what better way is to coin the girlfriend therapist, um, because I want my patients to see me as a girlfriend who just so happens to be non-judgmental, non-biased, and who's going to clinically reflect back to them what they need to hear, not what they want to hear. Um, and so it, it, it works. Um, and then when it comes to my lupus story, I was diagnosed in 2013. Um, I'm a two-time cancer survivor. So actually I had some other things going on when my oncologist was like, I'm not quite sure what's happening, but I do want to send you to refer you to a rheumatologist. And I was like, okay. So it probably took about two months to get a definitive diagnosis on what was going on with me. I just knew I had something very traumatic happen in my life in that April. I was diagnosed the day after my birthday. I was diagnosed July 11th, um, 2013. And so my cousin, who was like a twin sister to me, she was my twin cousin. She passed away suddenly. And so the emotional duress, I believe, is what caused me to have my first lupus scare. Um, my first lupus, not scare, flare. And so I realized that I couldn't move. My hands would get sore. I used to enjoy playing golf and I had to stop doing that um, because I just could not move them. It was physically debilitating and painful. And um, it was times when my skin would hurt, hurt to touch. Like it seems like it's so sensitive and I could not make any sense of it. And one thing that I learned about lupus is it's almost like every few years when I would have a flare, I would get a different symptom that I had not had previously. And so with cancer, I knew my hair was going to fall out. I expected it. I didn't care. I never wore a wig or anything like that when I was going through my cancer journey. However, when my hair started falling out with lupus, 
I didn't expect it. And I was so like, I don't want to say traumatized, but I, I, I kind of went into a depression a little bit because mm -hmm. I was like, I was not expecting this. Like I, I kind of did research and you find out about other things, but I, I cried where I never had cried as it related to me losing my hair with cancer mm -hmm. and so just learning still it doesn't matter how many years you know you've been living with something still finding out new things and new symptoms and trying to navigate where you are in that moment and just making sure that you are doing what you're supposed to do that you're limiting your stress you're communicating with those around you you have a support system i remember when i was dating so before I got go. married, my amazing husband, when I was on the dating scene, I was like, I don't need to tell you on like the first date, because if this doesn't work out, I don't need to be going into all of that. So when I feel like it's necessary, I'll tell you, I'm all about open honesty and transparency. But if we're just talking on the phone, I don't need to let you give you access to all of me in that way. So yeah. I remember I was talking to a guy and I think I wasn't feeling well or something. And I was like, yeah, I believe that, you know, I have lupus. And so he was like, what's that? Like, I was taken aback because you would have thought I told him I had the bubonic plague or something. He was like, his whole demeanor and the way he was talking to me changed. Like, you should have told me that. And it was very like, whoa. And so yeah. he blocked me, never talked to me again. And as a single woman at that time, I was like, Okay, do I need to reevaluate? Maybe I should have that as a line. By the way, I am a cancer survivor and a lupus warrior. Like, I mean, I that's hard. but it's hard to really try to. I think that that's one of the biggest fears that people have. You know, is like, how do I tell a new partner about what this illness is? You know, how do I how do I communicate that? And I think that that's something that probably presents a lot of intimacy. So, so I mean, I know in the initial shock of it, that was. That was rough, but how do you think somebody should go about, man, like telling somebody new about this, you know, kind of illness they're dealing? The easiest way would be you first being confident in your own diagnosis, right? Because you don't want your emotions to be impacted just because someone feels a way about what you live with on a daily basis. So getting very educated and comfortable, and I'll use that word loosely, in your own skin so that when you are sharing with people, you're not embarrassed. You don't feel like, oh, my gosh, I need to be on an island by myself. I'm not going mm -hmm. to find love. It's not for me. And then when you feel like, you know what, this is time for me to share this with this person, then that's when you share it because it's different for everybody. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you for sharing that. Your story, you know, I appreciate the personal piece you're bringing to it. You know, when we think about intimacy, we've been talking a lot about physical and emotional. And I think some of the physical challenges can be clear. But what are some of the emotional challenges that have come up with the couples you work with? Body image concerns and challenges. Like my body is changing. I don't look the way maybe I used to look and do they still find me attractive? Mm -hmm. The chronic pain aspect of it. Do, do Am I okay with my partner touching me in this way? Or mm -hmm. is it because I'm in a flare, maybe they need to touch me a different way or not even at all. And so we're also talking about the psychological impacts of the medications and side effects. Yes. Maybe if I'm more moody or I have more anxiety happening inside of my body because of the fear of the unknown. Oh my gosh, when might the next lupus flare happen? Will my medication stop being as effective as it was and they have to switch me to something else? And so these are all other things that come with living day to day with a diagnosis like this. Yeah. You know, I already know why I would send patients to you and refer people to you. But so for people who don't understand as much about what you do, like what are the special what are the special topics you really get into when you're talking about intimacy and how can you help someone different than another mental health mm -hmm. provider? So one of the things that I do when I'm talking to my patient, I help them to understand that intimacy does not only show up just in a physical sense, right? Intimacy might look like support from my partner. It might look like empathy and compassion. It might look like gratitude. It might look like appreciation. It might look like forgiveness. It might look like my partner 
responding to me in a non-defensive way. It might look like understanding. So these are all parts of intimacy that we don't necessarily always talk about. And so those are important. And do I have the communication with my partner so I feel open and vulnerable enough to go there and have these conversations with them about what I want, need, and desire? what I'm open to and what maybe I might not be open to in this moment because mm -hmm. I'm not in the right emotional or mental state or physical state. Mm -hmm. Thank you. No, I think that that's so important when you really think about who you can go to because sometimes the blogs don't feel like they're talking about us, you know, and, and what does it mean to have a person that can actually really speak to the things that you're dealing with? I know I am, uh, I am definitely somebody, I have a therapist and Lord knows it's an older black man. And I'm like, so let me tell you what happened. <laughs> <laughs> and using that test, I think that that's really important. Just being able to recognize, you know, being honest, having a space to be able to be honest, you know, about what you're dealing with is so helpful. So we have a few viewer questions. I don't know if we have any extra ones. I saw one kind of throw up. Actually, yes, we had somebody, a viewer ask, thank you so much. And if you are in this chat, make sure you add some questions we got some time left. How do you balance personal and professional with living with lupus? Like, how do you balance that, I guess, communication or having these conversations with people? You know, you have to, you, it gets pretty intimate in the office place too. Um, but how do you do that? You know, how do you have these conversations? It does. So I've been a therapist for a long time. And so I've learned to separate my patient's lives from my real life. And my real life, I have to realize. So normally when I'm driving home, if I'm not working from home and doing telehealth, I drive with no music. That's a way for me to get from my office home and I'm able to change hats. So now I'm a wife. Now I'm a mother. Now I'm a daughter. Now I'm a friend. And I don't have to be that caretaker in an emotional sense. Yes, for my children and my husband, but not from a clinical standpoint. So that is helpful in knowing that, okay, this is what I need to do. This is what I'm going to do. Making sure that I am taking the medications as I'm supposed to. I'm speaking to myself for real because sometimes that can be a challenge when it makes you feel a certain way. <laughs> so just being transparent, but making sure that I do everything that I need to do so I can stay well for myself. Because if I'm not well, I can't be well for my patients. I can't show up for them and be what they need when they need for me to be in whole space if I'm in a different emotional or physical state. Thank you. I don't, and, um, I don't know if there's any any conversation. Jokiva, do you have any any thoughts around that really quickly? Do you have, or actually, you, you got somebody here. Jokiva, I'm just curious if you have either an answer for that or maybe if you have a question for Dr. Court, you know, opening the floor for that as well. Okay, yeah. I just wonder how you how you how how you change hats on the way home. That that <laughs> I need more time just to ride for just one ride now. I ain't gonna lie. So trying to change hats from being um, an influencer and checking emails and doing all this, it becomes overwhelming. And to, you know, I have a four, four month old, she doesn't like to be put down at all. So how, um, like, do you meditate um, during that ride? And then just be like, you know, I'm leaving everything at the door. I'm leaving everything, all, all work aspects at the door at work. And then when you step out, you just take a deep breath and you just let everything go. So yes. The best way that I can say is I realize that it's not fair for my patients to have more of me than my family. So it's not fair for, you know, follow in your um, example, my followers or the people who subscribers, um, those individuals, I have to make sure that I'm giving the same amount of energy, not less than to my family than I do in other spaces, because balance is so important because our families are our foundation. Yes, our supporters and are part of our community, too. But who do we go to sleep with at night? Who do we wake up to? Who supports us? Who does all of these other things, right? And so understanding that you have to prioritize, and this is something that I personally am working on because I am a business owner and I own a group practice. And so needing to be available, but also adhering to the boundaries. This is, a, if this is family time, I put the little do not disturb, but it says with family or with patients whenever I'm doing something, because we have to realize that life is short. 
do I want to extend and exert all of this energy to individuals, not saying you don't at all, but to in, in individuals more so than I do the people who are next to me by me every single day? Mm. Yes, yes. I, I think this is, we have a good group in here. I feel like, I, you know, we got to move into bringing somebody else into the mix. But, you know, I think we've had so many really, really good conversations around relationships, around dating. But I also got to bring my single ladies into the room. You know, bring my bring my all oh, the single ladies. We couldn't clear the song. If it was up to me, the song would bring her in. But definitely representing. And this has been so helpful. But we're gonna play that game in a few that you created, Dr. Court. And now I'm gonna we're gonna show some love to our next guest, Ty. Now, Ty, she is a single mom of two. Both kids are about to leave home, and it is time for mom to bring back the focus on her and get back in that dating scene again. So Ty is going to give this and all of her, Ty gives this and all of the thoughts around um, everything on her podcast, So Opinionated. So tonight she's going to share some personal opinions on dating and intimacy there. Make sure you check out uh, her podcast, So Opinionated. And we're going to talk about dating and intimacy and we want to hear your dating adventures. Please make sure you are using that chat. We still have some time for some more questions going into this show or, or just reactions. Feel free. If you, if you feel something, let us know. But Ty, welcome to the virtual stage. So glad to have you. Hello. <laughs> hello, hello, hello. So now please tell us a little bit about yourself. Thank you. Hi, guys. My name is Ty. Um, I was diagnosed with lupus around 2016, 2017, um, I initially found out um, because I was doing fertility. In 2014, I decided that I was ready to have another child and I was having issues um, with getting like my menstrual and a lot of different things were going on and I wasn't too sure. So I saw a fertility doctor and I initially was diagnosed with PCOS, which is polycystic ovarian syndrome. Um, a lot of women actually suffer with it. I didn't know what that was, but it turns out it's pretty common um, and it affects getting pregnant. We have, you know, cysts and fibroid issues. It's very painful sometimes. Um, and that takes, that's a whole nother toll. Um, and while doing that, um, other things were coming up. I did not get pregnant, but I did do six IUIs and nothing came from that. But while doing that process for two years, two very long years, um, I was, I had other things going on. So I was losing hair. I was losing weight. I was anemic. I was having bone issues. Like my bones were hurting. There was just a couple of things. And my fertility doctor thought that there were things that weren't associated with PCOS. So they thought like maybe I had a thyroid issue, just a couple of different things. And they also sent me to a rheumatologist and I want to say maybe three or four months just because they were more focused on the PCOS. Um, it took them a while. And then finally, the my doctor was like, I'm pretty sure it's lupus. And then she did like a specific test where they test your autoimmune system and there's levels to that. And so my levels were where she was like, yes, you have lupus. So that's kind of the, that story and how I found that out. Um, I'm not a big medication, just in general, I don't like taking that. So I have a, nutrition, a nutritionist who helped me do the more herbal route. Um, initially it was helping these last few years, but maybe between last year and this year, probably due to stress, a lot of things have gotten worse. I'm in a lot more pain than I was just in the beginning. Um, and the, my weight keeps fluctuating and I'm losing a lot more hair. And there are a couple of other things like my legs swell up. Sometimes I can't move at all. I literally have to like sit and lay. Um, so they're testing me now for, cause they're just trying to figure out if there's maybe some other little things going on where I may end up having to take medication and not do the route that I've been attempting to be on. I was gonna say, it sounds like definitely lupus definitely is a, a lot of times it, it shows up with other things or, or, or different shows things, right? Right, Dr. Mikaela? I feel like that's something that you've heard as well. No, it's true. I mean, we have a lot of co-diagnoses. Lupus doesn't, you know, just happen alone for most people. And it can be hard because some of the symptoms feel vague and can overlap in lots of different syndromes, especially when you're talking about pain. But what you're saying, Ty, is so true to many people. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for bringing that in this space. And we have... 
not to do this, but we definitely have a, a whole episode talking about nutrition and how that can support and also like those kind of things. So everyone out there, please make sure you check out the past episodes. We did some great work around that. But um, but to bring it back to the conversation at hand, you know, how does having lupus impact your relationships? How do you see that? Well, now that I'm single, so I was married when I was diagnosed. I'm divorced now. Um, and so especially now that it's getting worse, um, I, it, it is it kind of sucks not having someone. I do have my daughters who are older. So my youngest is 18 and the oldest is 20. So having um, two young adults helps me out a lot because when I'm not feeling well or if I need them to do something, go to the like I can't even carry the laundry bag anymore just because I like my just lifting my arm is become painful. So to have them there is super helpful. I don't know what I'm going to do now that the 18 year old starts. She's going to college. The older one is already there. So that's going to be a little difficult. So it 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 sucks. Like I sit back sometime and I'm like, oh, what a great time to be divorced when you're sick. <laughs> but I, I mean, it just is what it is. What can I say? But it, it does suck. Well, yeah. you shared a little bit about, you know, some of the symptoms you're experiencing and the work you're doing with your medical team to figure out more about them. Do you bring up, you know, even more personal conversations like thoughts you have about intimacy or concerns you have around intimacy? Well, yeah, I mean, I have a therapist, which I feel all black women do, but um, I'm always talking to my therapist about it just as far as Sometimes I think it's good, right? So when I'm in a lot of pain or I'm just not feeling it, being single can kind of help that because I don't have to tell somebody, hey, I'm not in the mood today or I just want, you know, a back rub or I just need to lay down or, you know, you can't give attention. So sometimes I feel like that's the easier part. But then, of course, the harder part is also then wanting someone to be next to you or maybe rub your hands or, you know, you know, just help you with a bath or, you know, things like that. I do feel like that's where I struggle because then I get kind of lonely. Um, but I, you know, I talk about it with my therapist and I'm trying to figure out a way to not revert to where you're just settling, which is kind of what I've been doing the past couple of months. Like where, where if I need some attention or if I just don't want to be alone and you, you know, you call someone, I, I don't want that, I, that, that's what I was doing. And I try to, I want to kind of get out of that feeling of, you know, in the, in the moment where you're just like, I really could use somebody right now. And then you do that. And then you're back to feeling like, you know, you're, by, you're by yourself the next day. So. <laughs> That's so real. Thank you for bringing that in the space, Ty, just because, uh, listen, let's keep it real in here. Definitely did that. <laughs> you know, I think a lot of times we, we, you know, I, and it came up earlier and I was so thankful for Jakiva for, for bringing that up. Like a lot of times, you know, we think that it's okay to just have something to scratch the itch, you know, something that's there, but really thinking long-term about what we want, you know, what, what are the things that we need from a partner, you know, short term versus long term and long term versus short term, I think is helpful. I'm curious, Dr. Court, do you have any thoughts around that, that idea of like, you know, how do we get ourselves into a space, you know, where where we're receiving or in a space to, to accept or, or be open to the love that we, we probably deserve, right? Yeah, one of the things that I think is important is when you're, when, I, when I'm talking to my patients about dating, First, you have to see, do you have the time and the space and the capacity to date? Because it takes time. What you put into it is what you are going to get out of it. And so what I mean by that is, what is it that you're specifically looking for? And if you receive that, will you be ready to be able to receive that? If you say you want support, will you be open to it and not reject it because you haven't had it for so long or you're not used to it or it doesn't look like what you thought it would look like? And so those are all very important questions that before you even make the first dating profile, talk to the guy at the gas station, wherever it is, you know, asking, am I ready for this? And ultimately, what is my goal? What am I open to? What am I not open to? What do I want to discover? Because there's a different side of you. There's a dating side of you. There's a mom side of you. There's a woman side of you. And so there's different parts of you. And are all of these parts ready to really put the energy in when it comes to dating? 
Dr. Core, I have to throw this back at you. Like, did you do this yourself? Was there a point where back in your single days where you were like, let me really assess what I need and this is what it is? I absolutely did. And so I was previously married and then I was in a long-term relationship. And I remember in 2018, the person who I was dating, I was in the hospital for over 20 days and then I had to be readmitted back into the hospital. And I remember they left me to go on the trip. And I was like, I know this is not what I want. This is this is not this is not what I want. This face is everything. <laughs> she was like, if if Howard left, <laughs> his stuff would be down in DR or Puerto Rico or wherever he went <laughs> two days later. So I, I'm a big proponent of online dating. I said maybe yeah. I should have kept online dating because you meet a lot of people. And I say, if I'm online, right? And if I'm on these apps, I have to know that I'm not the only one that's one sane, that's not trying to catfish or, you know, go over, um, get over on somebody or use somebody. I'm a nice, decent person. I have integrity. I have morals. I have values. And I have to know that there are other people just like me, but you got to wade through the riffraff. And I have to say, after that experience with talking to people, I am so blessed with the husband that I have right now. I remember we weren't even, we were like a month and a half into dating and they found the tumor in my abdominal area. And I said, you know what? I know I got a lot of health problems. I said, I don't expect for you to be here. I, I, I don't want for you to think you're gonna hurt my feelings. If you say, you know what? This is a lot too soon. And he told me, he was like, I know I don't have to be here, but I want to be here because we're a partnership. And I've, I had never had that. Even when I was married, even when I was dating for that long, I never felt the support. It was new to me. So I was like, why he want to go to my daughter's appointment? Like, well, what is this about? So I was a little suspicious at the beginning. That's why I said you have to make sure you are ready to receive what it is that you are asking for so you don't reject it. And ever since then, he has been by my side, multiple flares, doctor's visits, surgeries, everything. He has never left. And so if you are single, I want for you to know this. Don't allow what you were living with, your current situation, what you look like, what you sound like, or anything dissuade you from thinking that you can have the love that you deserve. I mean, yes, <laughs> we did snaps, we did snaps. And I mean, I think that that's, you speaking life into folk because I think that, you know, we talked, you mentioned online dating and Ty, I was told that you, you didn't, you tried that and that was not the move. That was not it. What was, what made it not it? It just, there's too much wading through the world. It's just too much. Like you said, you know, you hope that there's someone, I definitely thought the same way. Like I'm single. <clears throat> I have older kids, you know, I have the time and I was, I'm saying to myself, there's got to be men out there who same thing, you know, either maybe single fathers or just, you know, single men who are looking for a relationship, but that's not what they're looking for. No, no man. <laughs> that's not I what they're looking for. I don't yeah. want to do any slander because I was going to ask like which apps are you on. <laughs> <laughs> I, did, I, I mean, I, I did. Don't, 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 you don't want to talk bad about nobody. I don't want nobody okay. to come. I did. I'm not saying there weren't. There are no good ones, but there's. I haven't found any that are looking to be in a relationship. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. They're okay with the situationship. They're okay with a friend with benefit. They're okay with the. You know, they'll take you to dinner, but anything more than that. That's not, it was too much for me. I had to tap out. I don't know, I had the opposite, I had the opposite issue. I, I go on a first date, he's like, I'm trying to get married tomorrow. <laughs> okay, so what, what happens then? Just, 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 just let me know. <laughs> but I, mean, I think you brought up some doctor. important points, Ty, you know, um, like expectations and navigating expectations. And I think it's an issue, whether it's online or in person. <laughs> And I see Dr. Kaur shaking her head, you know, tell us more about how you coach people to navigate these expectations. So I look at, okay, I asked them, write your bio. What are you going to put up there? What is it that you're going to put out there? Because sometimes the information we're putting out there is not that important than probably what we need to be putting out there. Again, managing expectations. You know, when I first got out there, I was like, I'm open. If it goes somewhere, it does, but I'm not putting too much pressure because if I put pressure on, I'm looking for a husband, I might miss red flags. I might miss yellow flags. 
I might not slow down and say, let me see, like, I really get, I want to get to know this person so that I'm not in a situation where they just said what you wanted to hear, because that's what you put in your bio, just in order to get you, and then they leave you. So you got to be very crafty, and I'm not saying manipulate, but you have to be crafty with the information that you put out there to make sure that sometimes you can sift through some of the people that may contact you before they contact you, and you're like, oh my gosh, they wasted my time time again. Why am I doing this? I'm going to get off. And again, with time, you have to think about it. If you're just going on every now and again and swiping or whatever, you're not putting any time. That's just like passive scrolling through social media. So am I actually looking at the people who are swiping on me or who are messaging me? Am I looking at their profile? Am I reading? Is something with about them connecting to me? And I also had levels. So we would do messages on the app for a while. And then I would if I felt comfortable enough, I would give you my Google number. Then if I felt comfortable with you after you met that level, we would then go out on a date. You still didn't get my real phone number yet because you might, you know, not eat with utensils. And I was like, okay. <laughs> so then after we went on a date, if I felt as though, you know what, this was okay. I think that they can get my um, phone number, then I would give them my phone number. I would have to say maybe only three people ever got to that point where they got oh, my real phone number. And my now current husband, when I was dating, I was getting to know people. He was probably number three out of my top five. And I never, ever, ever, ever expected myself to settle down with him because we are so different. I'm so over the top extra. He's so laid back, passive. I'm an empath. And a therapist, he's an engineer. So we're so different, but, and I never had different and it works so well. So never say what you won't do. Just see what you're open to and be honest with yourself about what you want. Awesome. And I, I know I want, I, I was seeing so many facial expressions with Jakeva and Howard, but we're going to go into this last segment and maybe uh, see if we have a little bit of, bit of time. I, I did want to see if you had something to say uh, between the two of you, actually, as a couple. I'm just curious. Y'all were looking at each other like, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. <laughs> right. Any final thoughts? Yeah. Um, I, at, at the beginning, I really had to learn that um, my lupus wasn't a bad enough baggage for me to settle you know, with being in relationships with people. So um, even when me and Howard were dating and someone might try to climb across my timeline and say something stupid like, you know, oh, girl, you know, because they're thinking there's sometimes men think that, hey, oh, because she has lupus, her self-esteem is low. Never that. It's never going to be low. I would drop you like a bad habit. It was times to where when we dated, he told me uh, I'm not ready for a relationship. I ghosted him. Because it's, <laughs> it's like we're not looking for the same thing, so why waste my time over there? Oh, he, he had to chase answer. me. Yeah, yeah he had to. <laughs> so mm-hmm. I understand what she was talking about completely. Um, and also, now you know, wasting time where it's not needed. I'm not about to give you my number if you're not going to be there later on. And then, or you become such a stock my phone, and I'm not even interested in you anymore. Right. You know. Right. So I understand I should have used that concept a long time ago because uh, when I was dating, I would just give out my number straight up and I would have to just block, block, block. So. <laughs> and I think also just to bring up into this space, the fact that it's just hard dating, period, you know, whether you yes. have lupus or not. And I think that that's something that we also have to recognize, you know, as what you said, you know, that these things are things that anybody, you know, can say, you know, there are things we go through, traumas we go through that make us think that we don't deserve anything. And so I think this conversation is something that we should be having more often with each other in more other spaces and with our friends and with our family members. And thank you everybody for bringing all of the different thoughts and points and perspectives into the space. And, um, you know, I think love is, is, a, is a very interesting thing. I think friendship love is very important too and having those people around you to support you. But we're gonna get into this game. We got a little bit of time left, but I've been waiting anxiously. Uh, Dr. Court, can you please bring up really quickly, like what 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 is this game? And so this is the game that I created. It is titled Sex Unveiled. And basically what it is, it is a way to be able for individuals to connect on a deeper level with their partners, because oftentimes it's difficult for us to talk about openly our wants, needs, and desires. And now the game is 
very, very heavy on the physical intimacy, but we're going to play around with some very lighthearted cards. So basically what the players do or the couples or anyone, you get, th you get three cards, a red, yellow, and green. And so red means close to, green means open to, and yellow means neutral to. So close to, absolutely, I don't want it. I don't want to be involved. Green, oh yes, I'm open. I would love to do that. And then neutral, yellow card, I'm not saying no, I'm not saying yes, let's have a little bit more discussion about it. And so when, like for example, I want for you to give me a thumbs up means yes, thumbs down means no, and then a level hand, that means uh, I'm not really sure. So let's just say the first card, cuddling. Are you open to, close to, or eh? <laughs> I love this. Okay. So you see that? And so what happens when you answer the way that you answer in the game with the card, what you would do is your partner would then ask you, why? You know, why did you answer the way that you answer? And I think this is an amazing game for single individuals so that they also start to think about, okay, what am I open to? What am I not open to? So when I do get into a relationship or connect with someone, on an intimate level, I'm able to share these things because I've already explored them with myself. So let's come up with another one. That who's familiar with soul gazing? What's that? Please. Yeah. What I mean, I, well, I'm, actually, like I'm just question. curious. Wait, really quickly. I saw this. Uh, this. I'm curious. Can I ask you, Jakiva? Why is that? Like, why was that a no no? Does that show up in the relationship? I'm curious. Just being poking around, being nosy right. for cuddling. Oh, yeah, it shows up, but it, it depends on how, you know, if I'm in a flare up, don't touch me. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, menstrual cycle, don't touch me. Right. Um, So, you know, it's like a hit and miss for him sometimes. Or the kids exhausted me that day, don't touch me. Mm -hmm. So, you know, um, and I have to remind myself to, um, even though I'm going through all that and I'm stressed out sometimes, I just need to take a deep breath and still give him his, give him his time as well. Because he's a cuddler. <laughs> He's a cuddler. That's so sweet. And Joe Kiva, one thing to add with that. So a lot of times what this does also, a lot of times we're so used to saying no, not right now, without qualifying why we're giving the answer that we're giving. So if I'm able to say no, not right now because I'm having a flare or I'm not feeling well, then you just don't leave the person with just no, give, leave right. me alone because then you leave them with rejection. Back. Yeah. yeah, I have to learn that just with my kids because I'm not the most affectionate. They'll be like, love you, mom. I'm like, okay. <laughs> I'm like, all right. <laughs> all right, we got, we got time for one more card. What was that? Soul gazing. So yeah, how soul do you feel about soul gazing? That's looking in the eyes. Yeah, so that's basically looking in the eyes, um, in someone's eyes for an extended amount of time. Now, you can do this nude or you can do this clothed. Um, and it's very powerful. And it's an intimate practice of getting closer to your partner. Um, and it helps to also build a healthy relationship. Because if I can just pierce into your pupils, into your soul, and we are just connecting without words, is deeply powerful. So are you open to that? Close to that? Or mm, I don't know. <laughs> They were doing it in a second ago. <laughs> like, look in my eyes, honey. <laughs> Howard, look. Howard, look. Look how Howard feels about it. <laughs> <laughs> well, it seems like these games are really, really, really helpful. This seems like a really helpful game for us to really explore uh, the idea of love. And um, and I think we didn't we didn't mention this. I did want to throw one more question in the mix when we talk about physical intimacy because we kind to talk a lot about communication and dating but just dealing with like the physical intimacy side of it um you know how do you have that conversation if you are somebody that doesn't like physical intimacy and that's something you struggle with as far as connecting and physical emotion how do you help somebody you only have like 30 seconds mm -hmm. to do this so you, you, have to, you have to get comfortable in your own skin. You have to get comfortable in your body. You have to look at yourself in the mirror. You have to be able to explore yourself so that you're not uncomfortable when you are exploring yourself with other people. And so really taking the time to get to know every inch of you. Why does my body respond this way? Why does it do this? I like this. I don't like this. So spending time with yourself so that you are more comfortable with experiencing physical intimacy with others. Thank you. We have to come to a close. This has been such a great conversation. I hope everyone's going to continue it at home with your friends, family. 
Um, we just like to say thank you to Biogen for giving us the space to have the conversation. Again, if anyone is interested um, about getting more information, please check out the link below, biogentriallink.com. And join us again. The conversation is going to continue, not next week, but the week after on Tuesday, August 8th, same time. We're going to be talking about pregnancy and family planning. And now we'll give Chanel some time to close us out in her beautiful spoken word. I just want to be free, and this is freedom. Brown eyes like heart valves, I know what flows through you, our rhythm in sync, laughter sticking to the roofs of our mouths, clutching stomachs, caressing joy as it floats around us through all of our days. We both were born and bred to make bread, but not taught how to need, and here we are, learning that love is liberation, wiping the work off of our brows, washing the worry away with our lips. This place feels like safety a place no limits exist. If love always floods my words, if patience walks in the room before me, if love, if love is on both of our hearts. Thank you so much. See you all on August 8th. Thank you. Have a good night.